Welcome back to Fridge Stuck, where we discuss the illusions and references in Homestuck. Today we're covering half of what I like to call the game races. Homestuck has a fair number of people and creatures that populate the Spurb and Scrub games, so much so that this video is going to be a two-parter. Welcome to the screen, what I like to call the medium races, characters that live and work solely on the planets of the medium or the veil. Underlings are monster enemies that game players fight during their sessions as soon as they enter the medium. They are commissioned by Durst agents like Jack Noir and opposed consorts, the players, or their guardians. They are not used in the battle for Skya with the Carapacians. Underlings come in a variety of body types, the kids naming them after classic fantasy baddies like imps, ogres, basilisks, liches, and gycyclopses, to name a few. Those might not be their official titles, though, since the wayward vagabond is not familiar with the term imp when called one by the readers. There is a definite hierarchy of power when it comes to underlings. Imps are the least threatening variety, because players run into them first and can literally tell them to get out of their house, and they'll comply. Naturally, it scales up from there, but it's implied by Karkat Vantas. There are super powerful variants of underlings that are put in place specifically to stop the scratching of a game, which we do see in Sound Page Cascade. Usually, an underling's body is composed of a type of element connected to their planet's player, and when defeated, they drop that same sort of grist to use in the game's alchemy system. In addition, they can drop building grist used by the server players and vitality gel that's for healing the client players. What's notable is that underling appearances and powers are affected by the pre-entry prototypings of the kernel sprites, something that Carapacians need the royal rings to accomplish. However, all these notes can be thrown out the window when it comes to null sessions, where pre-entry prototypings don't occur, like with Caliborn and the Alpha Kids. We don't even get a look at what the underlings look like in Caliborn session, but in Void sessions, both underlings and consorts on all the planets are zombified skeletons that don't permanently die. Consorts, hopefully meaning companion or associate and not the spouse of a noble, are the residents of the player's planets in a game session. Usually peaceful and admittedly kind of simple, consorts act as NPCs to their game's players, creating quests, selling fray motifs and stocks, and assisting the players with religious fervor. Because that's kind of what it is. Consorts can have low-key beliefs based on their respective planet's features and lore, like the salamanders and the parcel pixies of Loas, and their belief that John will restore the land, but all the consorts worship the Genesis Frog, creating large frog-themed monuments out of stone. This makes sense considering all the consorts are animals known as herptiles, amphibians and reptiles, masters of land and water. It's claimed that webcomic creator Andrew Hussey said consorts are a self-referential callback to the four races of the kingdoms in Problem Sleuth warring factions who end up united in the end of the comic to fight the big bad. Funnily, at the end of Homestuck, the kids create four kingdoms post-game, Human, Troll, Carpatian, and Consort. Most of the consorts have a specific noise that they're known for, except for the turtles. This is possibly because not even I can think of a non-disturbing noise that a turtle could make. But most likely, the in-universe reason is because Rose the Lawn's turtles are terrified into silence. What a sociopath. As far as we know, yellow salamanders, blue iguanas, pink turtles, and red nacodiles, both alive and skeletal, are the only variants of consorts that exist, as they're the only ones seen in the iconography of Spurb and Scrub. But there are a few oddball additions I need to cover. The following creatures are not official consort races, but instead might be something referred to as game constructs, 
beings that might serve some kind of mysterious purpose that does not immediately affect the players, but are sure as heck not nearly as helpful as a consort is. Aired in Ampra's planet, Loa, the land of wrath and angels, unsurprisingly had angels. Their appearance possibly either a reference to Quetzalcoatl from Mesoamerican myth or the biblical seraphim, both optionally depicted with feathered serpent forms. The angels are noted to be calm, but when attacked are difficult to kill and super fast. Aridan also mentions that they weep, causing many to think about the parallels to the speedy and deadly nightmare fuel that are the Weeping Angels from Doctor Who. Aridan attacked his angels on sight and relayed that they didn't drop grist, causing Karkat to say that the angels are probably game constructs, not specifically stating that they're consorts. What is interesting about the angels is that they have lore on their planet that overlaps the multi-session, mentioning a Lord of All Angels, someone Aridan suspects to be Jack Noir. However, after introducing literal cherubs, it's most likely referring to Lord English, or possibly Jake English, since he has shown to create angels when hopes floating. On Solik's captor's planet, Lobath, the land of brains and fire, there are floating brains. When we first see them, they seem to be swarming Solik's hive, but we don't know if they are just curious or if they were attempting to harm their session's players. Fefri Pesci's was seen fighting some, notably able to fork a few of them, but not gain any building material. It's never confirmed if these brains are consorts or game mechanics, but they are certainly not underlings. Fefri is later seen wielding a weapon made of brains later on, meaning she managed to capture log a brain and was able to alchematize with them. It's unknown whether the brains had any lore or the ability to communicate with their player. It's insinuated that Caliborn's session had consorts on all his planets, but he also had leprechauns, who became members of the Felt. I've already talked about them to death in other videos, so yeah. As for the trolls, it's not officially confirmed which troll had which consort. It's believed through inference that Vriska might have had salamanders, Teresi the crocodiles, Kanaya had turtles, and Tavros iguanas, all tying back to their patron kids or crushes during Spurb. Denizens are powerful godlike NPCs in the game that live on the planets of their session. They are always asleep at the start of the game. But if their designated player passes through seven spirograph gates, they wake up. This is weird because you can just waltz into their lairs and wake them up early, but this action leads to the insta-death of the player. Denizens are the creators of the underlings, and control them to an extent. They can also be the source of strife on their planet's lore, causing many to think of denizens as antagonists to their games, and considering that denizens sit upon a hoard of grist useful to the game's ultimate alchemy, it's understandable that most players are keen to wake and kill their denizens as soon as possible. However, these titans are very misunderstood, as their main purpose is to offer the choice to their chosen player. The choice is a decision that the player has to make when offered, usually involving action or inaction on some major event involving the player's death or the session's scratching. The denizens speak in a language that can only be understood by their chosen heroes, but it's kind of unclear how they choose their heroes in the first place. We see in the human sessions that their denizens are based on the kids' web browsers, but that's the only connection we got. It's not the colors, it's not the aspect, so it probably has to do with the mythologies that they're based on. Let's talk about as many as we can as quickly as possible before I continue to the last section. John's denizen Typhius is based on a Greek monster with the same name, which might come from the Greek word for whirlwind. The father of all monsters, he is said to be so terrible and fierce that after he was defeated by Zeus, god of the sky, he was sealed under a volcano ruled by Hephaestus. Dave's denizen is based on the Greek god of many things, including blacksmithing, technology, sculptures, and fire. 
Said to be lame in one foot and maybe a little bit ugly, he was the hapless husband of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. One of his associated symbols is a hammer, which is why his homestuck counterpart has fear no anvil as a weapon. Cetus, in Greek myth, is a large fish, whale, shark, or serpentine sea monster, which explains its homestuck counterpart's appearance on watery planets, especially on Lolar, where all their fish have gone missing due to the denizen's appetite. In myth, it typically appears as a foe for a son of Zeus to kill to rescue a damsel in distress. Half woman, half snake, Echidna is the literal mother of all Greek monsters, from Kerberos to the Sphinx. In Homestuck, most of Echidna's art accentuates her feminine details, and her mother title might be why she tends to speak mainly with space players, the all-female creation aspect. The fact that she has quills might be a reference to the real-world marsupial, though. As mentioned in Jane's Fridge Duct, her denizen Hemera is the Greek primordial spirit of the day. Her alternate name is spelled the same as Dies, so it could be a pun on her player's life aspect. Depending on the telling, Hemera is either the daughter or sister of Nyx, the Greek goddess of the night. However, Homestuck's Nyx is spelled with an I. Nyx with an I means nothing, synonymous with zero or null, tying to Roxy's void aspect. The fact that Hemera and Nyx are opposite colors on the color wheel could represent the opposing factions of Prospid and Durst, as well as representing Calliope's Caduceus when combined. Yaldabaoth, or Son of Chaos, is where we start to diverge from Greek myth to Gnosticism, something I know very little about, so bear with me here. This might also spoil Homestuck too, if I'm correct in interpreting this. In Homestuck, Yaldabaoth is the rarest and most powerful of the denizens, a self-proclaimed god, and naturally is drawn to players who feel the same. It's assumed that in Soundpage Collide, when Union Jack loses his head and creates a black hole that takes most of Dirk's planet of Lotak, it transports Yaldabaoth into Caliborn's session. From what I could glean, in myth, Yaldabaoth is called the Demiurge, an egotistical spirit with a snake's body and a lion's head that claims they and they alone were responsible for the creation of the universe. He isn't a true creator, though, just an artisan who built using things that already existed in the physical world. Also, his mother is a lesser light of the real god, named Sophia, who regretted giving birth to him. After Sophia gave mankind a soul, the Demiurge became envious of man, rebelled, and later will end up as a ruler in hell along with the rest of the material world. Wow. The term Demiurge originated from Plato's teachings, specifically from Plato's Timaeus. Small wonder. Jake's denizen, Abraxas, also comes from Gnostic texts uniting the world after the Demiurge is overthrown. And yes, in some depictions, he does have a chicken head. <laughs> in myth and in pop culture, Abraxas is considered by some to be the uncreated god, to others a demon, and sometimes an angel. Psychologist Carl Jung used Abraxas as a representation of the driving force of synthesis, maturity, and oneness and that this Abraxas is more powerful than both the sun god and the devil, because he represents aspects of both? Abraxas is also used in pop culture as a magic spell, as his name is considered by some to be the root of the phrase abracadabra. And the Greek letters that make up his name is an assortment of sixes, ones, and twos. <sighs> that was so weird. I still don't get Gnosticism, and I don't think I ever will. And the last Fridge Duck fact for the medium game races is... The Frog Temples are structures that exist on Earth, Alternia, and supposedly before us. They're tall structures carved with images of consorts and frogs, capped by a larger stone frog at its top. The temples are surrounded by spires denoting how many planets are in a current session but they also have hieroglyphs that contain the code for the game on them, allowing the game to be manufactured and distributed for the Chosen to play. We see in the Beta Spurb game that the temple is floating in the Veil, where it later impacts into Earth about 413 million years before the session begins. 
as seen during Soundpage WV Ascend, during its stay near what would later become Jade's Island, the destroyed temple is shown to be reconstructed after impact. This begs the question, who repaired the statues on Earth and Alternia? Was it Homestuck's version of ancient human ancestors? But how would they know the code? Did it grow like a plant would? I mean, it's possible certain minerals can grow, but the ruins look so well preserved and designed, and you know how I feel about designed things. Was there a stray consort? Could a lizard survive a crash like that? How long do consorts live, and how would it have found its way to the Vale in the first place? Maybe it was Becquerel, since it is part of his main objective as a First Guardian. Oops, that that's right, I cut the First Guardians from this draft. I guess we'll never know. Great. My brain needed something to overthink. Thank you guys so much for watching this Fridge Duck episode for the first look at the Spurb Game Races. I hope you enjoyed. Is there a fact that I missed? Is there a character or concept that you'd like to see? Leave it down in the comments below and it might end up on the show someday. Be sure to give a like, comment, subscribe, and share with a friend, and check out my Patreon, and I will see you all next time. Bye! They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Hey there. Consider becoming a patron? Just like the phenomenal Bleed Red, Alexander Madeline, Uranium Coffee, and Ryan Nelson.